Okay, Althea. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Jonas Nursing and Veterans Healthcare. Um, as you know, today we'll have our presentation on environmental health and nursing by our Dr. Barbara Sattler, who is a professor at the University of San Francisco and an international leader in environmental health and nursing. She's also a founding and active member of ANI, the Alliance for Nurses, of Nurses for Healthy Environments, where that helps to integrate environmental health into nursing education, practice, research, and policy and advocacy. Dr. Sattler has worked at the local level in communities facing environmental health risks associated with lead-based paint, pesticides, Superfund sites and risks associated with gas and oil extraction, including fracking. In addition, she's been an advisor to the US EPA's Office of Child Health Protection and the National Library of Medicine for informational needs of health professionals and, and environmental health. Dr. Sattler has been a recipient of the NIEHS, HUD, and EPA grants, as well as grants from a host of private foundations. She's also a registered nurse with an MPH and a DRPH from John Hopkins School of Public Health and a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing. Thank you. Um, I want to welcome everyone for joining our special webinar today. It's Earth Day. Um, so this is a very timely topic. Um, briefly, I want to acknowledge um, Barbara and uh, Donald Jonas, who are our founders for Jonas Philanthropies and specifically have supported nursing and veteran health care. Uh, we're coming up to our 15th anniversary in 2021 and year to date have supported uh, scholars all over the country. Um, Jonas Philanthropy has three areas of focus, one being Jonas Nursing and Veteran Healthcare, the second being um, children's environmental health, and the third being vision. Uh, year to date, we have sponsored over 1,200 scholars focused on multiple um, issues uh, and conditions across the country. We are represented in all 50 states and want to take this opportunity to thank the deans and faculty for supporting and mentoring our students across the country that are pursuing either their PhD or DMP. I want to encourage everyone to please tweet um, at Jonas Impact and use the hashtags Jonas Scholars. We will have the session recorded and available after, and you can see our upcoming events on our Jonas website. Um, and please, as a reminder, use the chat feature that's available to you via Zoom. And we have staff um, looking so that we can pose any questions that come up to Dr. Sattler as our uh, session proceeds later today. So you're up. Can you see your slide? Barbara, you see your slide? Yeah. You see it, Maggie? Yeah. You might be just on your screen. Let me see here. I apologize, but my, my I can't see the slides. We have uh, 18 participants on. OK. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest we do this um, this way then, um, um, Wanda. I've got my slide deck up on my screen. Okay. From my PowerPoint. Okay. And I'm assuming you've got the, uh, the first slide up. Yeah. Uh, so let's just do it that way then. Okay. Okay, so. Um, thank you so much, and I'm happy Earth Day to all of my nursing colleagues around the country. I'm delighted uh, that you are taking the time today to um, celebrate Earth Day by learning a little bit about some of the challenges. And um, next, please. I think that you all will agree that um, we've made a bit of a mischief in terms of our air, water, 
food, soil. Um, and I'm going to be covering very quickly just a range of things um, that you might want to be aware of and, um, and recognize also that we'll have some opportunities in the future for additional webinars for some sessions at the Jonas Conference. And also, um, Annie is available uh, and offering all kinds of other um, webinars and informational sessions. So um, next, please. Charlotte Brody um, is a registered nurse. She was involved in one of the first biomonitoring studies in the country. And on one single day, um, they tested Charlotte's blood and urine for the presence of 214 chemicals that were, um, that were chosen because they all had pretty toxic effects as per the peer-reviewed literature. And on that day, 87 chemicals were found in Charlotte Brody's body. And so next, what we know about those chemicals is many of them had multiple uh, potential toxic risks. And uh, they included carcinogen, the carcin cancer as one of the risks, but they also included reproductive health problems and neurological health problems and others. So you might ask, you know, where did these chemicals come from. This is a nurse. Next, please. Well, the truth of the matter is that they come from, they come from the very many products that we have in our everyday lives. They come from the exposures we have in hospitals as nurses. They come from the air pollutants and the water pollutants that we experience. And, and they come uh, at us in our air, our water, our food, and our products. Next, please. So what, um, what you need to know is that now the Centers for Disease Control every year is also measuring toxic chemicals in human bodies. And what they have been discovering is very, very similar results as to what is in our bodies. And they are now studying over 350 chemicals that should never be in the body that include pesticides and solvents and plasticizers and other things. And we are discovering that we are awash in these, in these chemicals. And even worse, next please, when studies have been done looking at umbilical cord blood, what we've discovered is that many of these same chemicals are found in umbilical cord blood. And what that means is that we are basically creating pre-polluted babies. These are babies that are experienced the same kinds of uh, chemicals that are in the mother's body are then circulating in, in the child or in the, in the newborn. Next, please. So the chemicals that are in the air and the water and, and our food, uh, next please, are winding up here, which is everybody's first environment. So if we can think about how we can protect this environment from toxic chemicals, we'll have taken care of the birds and the bunnies and everybody else in our ecosystem. Um, next, please. But instead, right now, what we are doing is we are delivering pre-polluted babies. And that's really, as a nurse, that's totally unacceptable. Next, please. So the old adage, uh, we are what we eat, is certainly true, but we're also what we eat, what we drink, what we breathe, what we slather on our body in terms of the products that we use. And so I'm gonna spend some time talking about some of the risks, and it is just uh, really the top of the iceberg in terms of the myriad chemicals and kinds of exposures that we have. And I'd like to preface this by saying, as you, um, as you learn um, throughout this discussion about some of these exposures, to think about what it means, um, what kinds of chemical policy failures we have that allows us to have these chemicals in our bodies and in our environment. So next, please. When we think about our home environments, we bring, uh, we bring products into our homes. Some of them are aerosolized. Some of them we use for cleaning. Um, some of them we track into our homes, the ambient outdoor air from outdoors, wherever it is that we live, whether it's in a fairly pristine area or an urban area with lots of uh, vehicle act, um, activity. 
or if we perhaps are living in an area that's had um, storms and now we've got mold, all of these things are creating a, a range of health risks. Next, please. So how many of you think that when you buy a device that's a fragrance device and it says it's rose scented, actually had anything to do with a rose? Next, please. Well, most of the things that we buy that say they are scented by rose or freesia or pine or any other sort of scent that they're saying, oftentimes these scents are actually synthetic. So they are, they are made oftentimes by petrochemicals or with petrochemicals. And um, the truth is that when it says fragrance on our shampoo bottle or on our deodorant, um, there's no other chemical information. So often we can't even look them up to determine whether or not there are health risks. And so there are labeling issues here in terms of our right to know. But we do know that many of the fragrances, when they have been evaluated, have the potential to be endocrine disrupting and also have other health risks. Next, please. So I'd like us to think about this word persistence because many of our harshest chemicals are persistent. They remain intact. So their original use, they remain intact, but then when they get into our air and water, they remain intact. They wind up um, moving around the earth. They wind up then being back on plants and fields in agricultural locations. We then wind up eating those products and then it starts over and over again. They persist. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of persistent chemicals now. The first being flame retardants. Flame retardants are chemicals, and there are several of them, but these are uh, perfluorinated chemicals um, that can be found in pretty much all of the cushions and mattresses in, in the United States. And they were used originally because we wanted them to uh, provide that characteristic of flame retarding. Um, but the truth is that what we've discovered is they don't even do that job. We also know they're in children's car seats and about a little over 50% of, of the floors in the United States are covered with carpets and most of them have flame retardants in them. They're also found in a variety of other things, electrical devices, building materials, and car interiors. Next, please. But what we know about these chemicals is they're toxic. They have the potential to cause endocrine disruption. Um, they can cause reproduction and immune dysfunction, birth defects. Um, they are neurotoxic, and they also um, can be carcinogenic. And these are chemicals that are found really pretty much in all of our homes. So another chemical, um, next please, are chemicals that are used um, also in a range of, uh, of products. Oh, sorry, these are, um, these are perfluorinated chemicals and they are used for stain resisting, for non-stick characteristics. Um, and we find these in our carpets and other places as well. Um, they are also water resistant, and they're used in firefighting foam. And the use of firefighting foam, especially at airports, has created the conditions for many waterways around the airports to wind up being contaminated with these chemicals. Next, please. The health effects that are associated with these chemicals um, include risk for low birth, uh, birth weight babies, also, they're immunotoxicants. The PFOA, which is a particular one of these um, uh, particular chemical uh, classifications, is known as a carcinogen. And then the PFOS um, is a thyroid disrupting uh, hormone. So these chemicals, the, the flame retardant and these PFOS chemicals, are, are really ubiquitous in our environments, in our homes, in our schools, and in many of our workplaces, including hospitals. Next, please. What we've discovered, and this is, um, this is something that's really got the attention of the EPA and a lot of movement on this issue, is we've discovered 
that PFAS is now being found in our drinking water. And this is from the various ways that contamination happens and is of much concern, obviously. Next, please. So let me just talk about endocrine disrupting chemicals. There are so many things that happen in the human body that are orchestrated by our endocrine system and having to do with cognition, having to do with reproduction. And yet we have several different chemicals that are in our plastics and that are in fragrances, including bisphenol A, BPA, and including phthalates, uh, another chemical that's especially found in uh, plastics, but also in many personal care products. And these uh, can be endocrine disrupting chemicals. And to show you one way in which they can be uh, disrupting, next please. This was, um, these are two rats that were in an experiment where they as pups were exposed to bisphenol A or BPA. And they were given the same diets, given the same exact conditions in their cages. And as these pups grew into adulthood, the one on the left was the one that was exposed to BPA. And the one on the right was not, was the control. And what we're discovering about some of these endocrine disrupting chemicals is that they are what we are now calling obesogens. These are chemicals that change the metabolic activities in the organism, or in this case, the rat, such that they are going to be obese compared to the controls. Next, please. So many of you probably have heard of BPA and what you'll find now on the shelves of our stores are products that herald themselves as BPA free. Regrettably, some of them are now using BPS. Well, this is a chemical that hasn't been studied as much, but the little that we're beginning to look at in terms of this chemical is showing us that this can be potentially toxic too. And this is what we refer to as a regrettable substitute. And until we really get a better handle on our chemical policies and require that companies do pre-market testing, we're going to continue to see these kinds of regrettable substitutes. Next, please. So how many of you would have somewhere in your home, your garage, under your sink, a, a pesticide? Something that you'd be using for ants or, or uh, some other, or, or mold, or some other thing in your house. Pesticides are chemicals, next please. They're chemicals that are formulated to either kill something or halt its reproduction. And so chemi these chemicals must be registered with the US EPA. And interestingly, even your antimicrobial hand soap that you might have in your purse right now, that's a registered pesticide. It's a chemical that was formulated to kill microbes and is categorized as a, as a pesticide and registered with the EPA. Next, please. So when I talk about health effects of pesticides, what I wanna be very clear about is this is not all pesticides causes all of these problems, neurotoxicity, endocrine disruption, reproduction problems, and cancer. Um, not all of them do this. But what we as nurses need to do in our assessment when we ask our patients about their use of pesticides is then know where to find the information about that specific exposure. So next please. So where do we have exposures? Well, we have them in our homes, from our home use. We sometimes use them and actually um, prescribe. If we've got a child with head lice, we're gonna pres prescribe a pediculicide. That's a pesticide that kills lice. We also know that many pesticides remain as residues on our foods. And um, the Environmental Working Group has found that 70% uh, of the US uh, produce that we buy actually has pesticide residues on it, measurable amounts. Next, please. We know that pesticides cross the placenta, they cross the blood brain barrier, and they also wind up in breast milk. So those exposures that we have, once again, think about the persistence here. We have the exposures, um, and now we are uh, handing those exposures down to our newborns. Next, please. 
So do we even ask our patients when we see them about their pesticide use? Well, I think that's a really important thing for us to do and then to know what to do when we answer them. Uh, if they do have a pesticide exposure and say yes to that. Next, please. So what I'd like you to know is that the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments has a wide range of assessment tools that you can use on our website. You can just download them. And I put up here a pre prenatal environmental health questionnaire that was created by a nurse midwife, Katie Huffling, who's who's now actually the executive director of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, and she used this in a prenatal clinic. So there are ways that we can ask these questions. Next, please. In preparation for participation on this webinar, some of you actually did some of these things. You looked to see what was in your food in terms of pesticide residues. You looked at one of your personal care products and found out what um, potential toxic chemicals there were in it. The same for your household products. We can do these same kinds of assessments um, for our patients or for those who are are capable of it, we can give them tools so that they can do self-assessments. We also then know and need to know where to go for the peer-reviewed literature. And um, ToxNet is a suite of uh, National Library of Medicine databases and informational sources that are peer-reviewed um, and that are high quality. So I would recommend using them and um, if you go onto the website of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, you'll find information on how to use those databases. And there are also tutorials on the National Library of Medicine website. Next, please. So some other ways that nurses have been involved in environmental health, and especially as we celebrate Earth Day today, is in bringing healthier food sources to our hospitals, nursing homes, other institutions, to our schools, as well as um, making recommendations to our patients. And this slide here the, on the left-hand so slide was the opening day of the uh, farmer's market that was sponsored by the University of Maryland Medical Center. The garden on the bottom is a garden that's sponsored by Bon Secours Hospital. And the top right is a, um, is a rooftop garden uh, in a hospital uh, in Maryland. So variety of ways to bring uh, healthy food, bring nature, uh, bring community together um, to celebrate um, healthy and sustainable foods. Next, please. Another um, way that nurses have been doing this is helping to uh, support things like Meatless Mondays, where um, not only do you have a day where all the meat, meals are made without meat, but using those opportunities to then educate patients about um, why we're doing that from the perspective of uh, health and climate change. And, um, and then for those hospitals that are going to continue to serve meat, it also then frees them some money up from that day's cost savings to buy better meat that is more sustainably raised. Next, please. Several years back, um, I was one of the researchers that did a survey of nurses, and we surveyed 15, over 1,500 nurses in over 50 states um, to look at what kinds of exposures they had. And then we asked them, uh, and they provided us with self-reported information on their health effects. And at some point in the future, um, we'll spend some time in a webinar talking more about that survey. Uh, but that gave us some information and insights. And next, please. One of the things that we discovered is that nurses who uh, regularly administer um, medications, and these are student nurses, um, that they have the potential to have exposures. Um, and what we've discovered is that those nurses who um, most often administer medications had higher risks of uh, having an, a diagnosis of adult onset asthma. And what we know is that nurses are the second highest category of workers in the United States to have that diagnosis, and second only to janitors. 
Next, please. So we thought about this in terms of um, what we do with medications, especially our pediatric patients or our elderly patients. And one of the things we do is we split and we crush medications. And mind you, these, many of these medications are biologically active at parts per million. And so what we've been discovering in our interest in looking at this issue area is that there are a lot of, of drug residues that are left in our medication room. And Azita Amir, who is a researcher at the University of Alabama, is now doing some very interesting work with a, a controlled room to look at what kinds of exposures we really have. Um, and so stay tuned to that because I think that's gonna be really important research for nurses um, for us to maybe make some changes as to how we administer medications, including the splitting and the crushing. We do know that, next please, that many of the medications um, have the potential to be asthmagens. These are common medications that we give. And an asthmagen is a, is a chemical in this instance that has the potential to cause the disease of asthma, not just to trigger it in somebody that has it. So there are a number of things in the hospital that we're concerned about. And, and now, um, next please, and I'm hoping that the slide is up, that's up, Wanda, is a picture of the earth and the sun. Yep, we're on. And I am going to thank you so much, Wanda, for forwarding the slides. I'm going to now just switch gears for a minute and talk about climate change, because especially on this day of Earth Day, I would be remiss to not talk about that. And so for those of you who might have trouble in describing to a fellow nurse what exactly climate change is, I'm going to take two minutes to just give you my little elevator speech. So first of all, for the entire time that the sun and the earth have been together, the sun has been warming the earth. And, um, and what has happened then with those sun rays coming onto the earth is some of the atmosphere keeps that warmth in and has been able to moderate the temperatures so that life on earth has been able to proceed as we've had it. And, um, and some of those rays will actually then uh, be released beyond the atmosphere and just go out into the, into the universe. Next, please. But what we know now is that there are a host of man-made chemicals and some naturally made chemicals, certainly from forest fires, some are naturally occurring. But for the most part, we have been multiplying the number of man-made chemicals and these chemicals um, specifically the ones that are categorized as greenhouse chemicals, are now forming this sort of blanket out there in our atmosphere. And this blanket is reducing the capacity of the reflected heat from being released into the, out into the universe. And so it is staying within that, um, that area and it's starting to warm up the earth. Next, please. Now, just for some visual and for an idea of how this happens, most of you have left a car in a hot parking lot at one point in time with the windows closed. And what you discover is that when you get back, it's much hotter inside than it is outside. In this instance, um, if it was 80 degrees outside with full sun, within 10 minutes, it's going to be 99 degrees in this particular car. This was tested. So this increase in heat within the car, next please, is very similar to what's going on on Earth. And there are the term is the greenhouse effect because these greenhouse gases that are now sur surrounding the earth are causing global warming. And you might ask, well, where are these chemicals coming from? Next, please. Well, the sources of greenhouse gases are many. The biggest source is from our energy production but also from transportation and from agriculture and from industry, from a variety of other places. But, but energy is a big heavy lift and 35% um, and of our greenhouse gases are currently coming from there. 
So next, please. So when we, we, we used to call it global warming, and that term got very confused because in some places um, people were having colder winters and then global warming, that term didn't make sense. So we now refer to it what it really is creating, which is global climate change. And, um, and I know that you are all aware of the effects that we're seeing around the globe with regard to climate change. Next, please. You also, we, we all, as nurses, know that at 98.6, um, we feel pretty good. That's a good temperature for us as humans. But once we get up to 100.4 and higher, we have a fever and we're starting to not feel very well. Next, please. So all of, the, all of the plants and the microbes and the animals on Earth all have a range of temperature in which they can live. They need sunlight and they need water and they need air and they, and, uh, and, and they need some kind of food source, but they also need a temperature range. So as we begin to shift the temperature on Earth, the level of adaptation that we would need and the speed of adaptation of our plants and animals is not happening. And we are beginning to see uh, species loss. Um, next, please. But we're also recognizing, uh, and the term planetary uh, destabilization was actually written into a Department of Defense report about climate change. Their feeling was that um, the level of changes, the amount of disruption of food supplies, of weather, of floods, um, extreme weather, um, was going to create uh, planetary destabilization, including uh, uh, climate change, refugees, and movement around the war world. Uh, and then also uh, wars over resources. Um, so. So even our Department of Defense is recognizing the importance of us looking at this from the big picture perspective. Next, please. But from our smaller perspective as nurses, in places where we have excessive heat, we're seeing more people with the heat exhaustion and more people dying from extreme heat. And the most vulnerable are going to be the elderly, homeless, people who work outdoors, um, certainly the agricultural workers around the country and around the world. Um, we need to be making sure that our, in our emergency rooms that we understand the first warnings of this. We need to make sure that these various patient populations and vulnerable public health populations understand um, excessive heat and what they can do about it, as well as their advocacy organizations. Next, please. We also know that, and we're starting to see this in various places around the earth, that climate-related uh, crop failures are happening with either extreme heat and, um, and droughts or the opposite of flooding and uh, failures from that perspective. And this is going to create the conditions for, uh, for food and nutrition problems. Um, closer, next please, closer to home for me. Uh, I live in Sonoma County in California in October 2017. We had huge fires. We had more in 2018, just north of where I live. And these devastated whole communities. And um, while the fires are in the news for a week or two, the devastation in these communities persists. And in the community on the bottom two photos there are Coffee Park, which is about an hour, uh, sorry, a mile from my house. And they are just now real, really starting to rebuild almost two years uh, after. Next, please. Um, the photos that you see here um, were that of that same fire. And you see in the bottom right, uh, that was the Kaiser Hospital in the background is a flame. These nurses and others are moving an intensive care patient uh, out through the parking lot and to a waiting um, emergency vehicle. Um, they evacuated the entire hospital. They then in the recovery stage had to um, take all of the products out of that hospital and, um, and replace them. Next please. We know that the, the level of uh, patient care disruption and community disruption 
uh, was horrendous. Um, we're lucky that we have incredibly an incredibly strong community. The nurse in the right-hand corner here, while she was taking care of patients and helping them move out of the hospital, her own home burned to the ground. And so incredible disruption around the fires. Next, please. This map shows you where in the country, so um, not quite half of the country is at risk for large fires. Um, and interestingly, uh, Florida, I, and I had to look that up, but they have actually had some serious fires in Florida, as well as the ones that you've probably heard more about in the West of the States. Next, please. So air pollution, um, certainly the fires have been creating horrendous air pollution in the Western states, but also the air pollution is being created by a range of other things that we need to better regulate and better address. Um, worldwide, the worst air pollution um, causing uh, health effects is actually indoor air pollution from cooking stoves in, uh, in the global south. Um, something for us to be aware of. Next, please. So we have an op obligation now, um, now that climate is changing, so should we. And that um, you should know that the International Council of Nurses has a new position paper, uh, a pos taking a position on uh, environmental health and on climate change specifically. And the American Nurses Association has adapted this. So looking at that and seeing some of the recommendations is really important. Um, also, uh, next please, note that, um, note that the, uh, some of the ways that we can begin to address this are in our hospitals, are participating with our green teams. And if we don't have one, well then, uh, learning how you can be a leader and starting a green team. The green teams are not just in hospitals, they're also in schools and school systems, they're in nursing homes, they're in hotels, there are green teams in all kinds of places. But as nurses, we have an opportunity to take leadership and be engaged uh, in making the changes that are really important. Next, please. We know that uh, plastics are used in immense quantities in our hospitals and that uh, I, this, this statistic is sort of mind boggling, but nearly a million plastic beverage bottles are sold every minute on earth, a million plastic bottles. And these persist. Some few of them will be recycled and made into something else, but the vast majority are going to remain as plastic. Um, they may break down, but they'll still be plastic. They'll just be smaller particles. And I'm sure many of you have heard about the many ways that the oceans are now full of plastic. But what is really even more important is that we're beginning to see evidence that we are taking these plastics into the human body. And there's recent studies on this that are fairly alarming and um, and. I would recommend that you look into some of this. Um, we'll be having continued uh, webinars um, with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, and hopefully some of those will be co-sponsored by the Jonas Nursing Center. Next, please. So when we think about, um, when we think about plastics in the hospital, I'm old, and so when I was in nursing school and, and initially practicing as a nurse, the products on the right, these stainless steel products, are what we had in our hospitals and nursing homes and other places. Now, pretty much, you only see the products on the left. And these are not recycled, and they're not reused. They're either thrown away or they're given to the patients to take home. And um, this is just one of many, many instances where we can think like a nurse, assess the problem, plan for some changes, and um, make policy and practice changes that are going to help us with reducing the incredible environmental health risks and, and environmental and ecological risks that we're experiencing right now. So next, please. So I know I went very quickly through so many different things here, and there's so many things that I left out. Um, and one of them that hopefully we'll have an opportunity in the future to discuss 
um, is what's going on with Wi-Fi and uh, the new 5G or the fifth generation of, um, of the internet of all things. What does that mean in terms of potential exposures um, to us as individual unit um, users, to communities that are now going to have uh, higher levels of exposures because we're going to be using um, many more but smaller towers around our community. So that's a whole subject area I didn't talk about. But I think as nurses, if we use our nursing processes and, uh, and learn where the peer-reviewed literature is, which is sufficiently and, um, um, and effectively housed in the National Library of Medicine. Many of you know PubMed. Um, well, they've got additional resources that are around toxic chemicals. Um, and I, if we think about how we can make changes at home, in our communities, uh, institutionally within the, the universities where we work, the hospitals where we work. Um, for those of you who are engaged in your nursing organizations, how can you incorporate environmental health policies into your position papers um, and your positions, obviously? How can you introduce your legislative committees to these issues so that your nursing organizations will take a position? How do we then also work um, with other environmentalists and public health uh, organizations? Um, and then how do we also engage with the International Council of Nurses, the World Health Organizations on a global level? I don't expect that all of you will do it at all of these levels, but as nurses writ large, we have to be really thinking about how we do that. Next, please. So we clearly, can't have healthy people on, a, on an unhealthy or a sick planet. And um, for those of you who are not familiar, familiar with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, we're a now international organization of nurses, of all different kinds of nurses. We've got operating room nurses and public health nurses and school nurses and academics. And our aim is to help nurses to integrate uh, environmental health into nursing education, continuing education, into our practice settings, uh, how we can green our practice settings, as well as how we can integrate environmental health knowledge into our clinical practices, how we can incorporate environmental health into our research, um, uh, and think about variables that we might include into our existing research, or to straight up be doing environmental health research. Um, there are various ways that, um, that you can plug into the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. And we also have a policy and, uh, re policy and advocacy committee that expressly works on policy work at the state and the uh, national level. We have three working groups. Um, one is on chemical policies. Um, one, well, four, I should say. One is on energy and health. One is on climate change, and a new one that we've just started is on food and agriculture and health. And we would welcome uh, you to join those monthly calls for each of these um, issue areas and, um, and, and hope that we uh, will see more of the Jonas Scholars involved. Next, please. So we have time to take a, a question? Uh, I'm, I have three more wrap-up slides. Okay. So this is everyone's uh, first environment. And next, please, this is everyone's only environment. And the great, greatest threat right now to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. So this is really a time for us all to, to really jump in. Next, please. And so now I certainly will take questions. Um. One of the questions is, I often feel like we are preaching to the choir. How can we engage difficult to reach populations that are often most affected by climate change? That's a great question. And I think that um, what I try to do is not overwhelm people, but even though it may have seemed like I was the doom and gloom person here, I really, um, when I'm talking to community groups, 
Um, I think giving them information and also listening to them so that it's more of a conversation is really important. But I think one of our biggest obligations right now is to teach nurses. Um, there are almost 4 million nurses in this country and we are great communicators. So the more nurses who are working in the communities that are most affected, um, the more that we can be talking about this in a way and using our very trusted voices um, to express this information. Um, also, it's really important <clears throat> when we're talking about these issues to make sure that we can give people an action that they can take so that we're not just making them worried about something they feel like they can't do anything about. We're giving them small actions they can take in their personal lives, or if they're nurses at a university or hospital, what are the actions that they might be able, to, the first things that they might be able to do in those settings. So not telling them they've got to fix everything all at once. It's very, very overwhelming to people. I hope that's helpful. Um, one of the things that stood out a little bit in the presentation is the opportunity for collaboration at the local level. So when you gave the example of the farmer's uh, market, being able to work with SNAP or other um, opportunities for low-income communities to have access to that might be another low-hanging fruit opportunity to be at the table, at least at a community level, um, and engage some understanding or education around folks that come to that. Because that tends to support low-income, high-risk communities. That's exactly right. And in, in Maryland, we got, uh, uh, um, well, I got a, a um, United States Department of Agriculture grant to actually help hospitals that were in, um, they were in food desert communities to actually start farmers markets there. And um, other things that they sometimes did, uh, um, if they didn't have enough room because in urban areas to do a farmer's market, they dedicated a little space within their hospitals so that they have uh, produce stands uh, there. And uh, what's really important to note is that in hospitals, we've got low income workers there. And so this provided an opportunity and they might be going home to food deserts. Mm -hmm. So providing the food, um, just those little food kiosks with fruits and vegetables that were grown sustainably um, and locally, giving them those opportunities are really, really important. Um, another question, how can we instill corporate responsibility on chemical safety disposals? An example would be the EC8 via DuPont. I, I didn't understand what of DuPont. An example would be the EC8 via DuPont or C8 via DuPont. Okay, I, I'm, I'm not um, absolutely okay. sure of what they're talking about there, but I can speak more generally to the issue of corporate responsibility. I think that the way that we have been governing chemical policies in this country has allowed the industry to run ragged over the regulations. And that um, the truth is that we need to create policies that are based on public health. And uh, if we do that, we're going to require pre-market testing, which they do in Europe now, um, and they do in many other countries. And so this really shifts the burden of responsibility for proving that something is safe before it goes to market. Um, and that's one way. The other is that we need to be doing our regulations based on science. Um, and uh, right now we've got several different major pesticides and that really should be banned, that are banned in other countries. And the influ influence of industry over those regulations has been profound and has kept these chemicals in the marketplace as residues on our food, you know, if they're pesticides and so forth. So I think that we have to really play this one out in the policy arena. And that becomes the politics arena as well. I think there's another question. 
Yes. Um, where do we start in getting organic food into our schools to reduce pesticide exposure to our children and communities? Does anyone know of schools that have successfully done this and how? Yeah, so uh, there, are, there are a number of bills right now um, around the country that are really moving towards what we're calling a preference for organic foods because there are some foods that mm, it's really gonna be hard for school districts to get at, at the quantity that they need um, at, it, as organic. But what the policies that are being created have is a preference for organic foods so that when it, it is possible, even if it's a little more expensive to choose an organic product at the quantity that's needed to feed you know, a large food district, that they would purchase that. And there are a um, number of bills around the country. And for the person who's interested specifically in this, the new Food and Agriculture Committee of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments is going to be um, taking that one on because it's a really important one in terms of children's environmental health. Um, working with the National Association of School Nurses, working with um, some of the other organizations that represent school nurses as well. This is going to take a village, but the, there are many, many parents who want to see this happening. So partnering with parent groups as well um, is going to be a really important part of the sort of political force and power base that we're going to need to help making make some of those changes. And we're also going to need to recognize that as there is more of a, of a demand for products that are organic, those prices will begin to go down um, because more farmers will be converting to uh, organic processes and practices. So that shift um, needs to be made. Um, we're, we're seeing that some hospitals have those policies. For instance, Kaiser Health System has got a policy that um, is an organic preference. And you may want to look at your hospitals as well and talk with your um, directors of food services. Any other questions? Barbara, what's the um, intersect of the work that the nurses can do and partner with other interprofessional um, folks around this topic. Uh, for example, public health as one example, or bridging with corporate you know, America, where, where are there intersects there that are low hanging fruit where people can get involved to learn more about it? Sure, good question. So um, the American Public Health Association is the preeminent public health organization. They have an environmental health section. They have a public health nursing section. And we have been uh, cross-pollinating between those two sections. There's also another group uh, called the Quad Council that includes public health nurses from around the country, directors of public health nursing, um, the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. And we're also now in discussion with um, the school nurses and this group um, that intersects with the Public Health Association, APHA, um, have been working on these environmental health issues and on policies. Um, I should say that there are, some, there are some corporations that are really trying to do the right thing, that, uh, that have been making changes uh, uh, over the years in terms of their purchasing. Some, there are some big box stores that actually are um, making their product selection based on sustainability um, uh, sort of metrics. And we're very, very happy to hear about that. Um, and there are, so there are opportunities for us to work with those companies that are doing the right thing and really support them. I think there are really big, uh, particularly chemical manufacturing companies right now that are extremely resistant to change that are, um, that are really often not operating in the best interest of public health. And for those, we need to be increasing our regulatory activities so that, so that we're, you know, sometimes we give this, the carrot and sometimes we need a little bit more of the stick. So I think we need to assess when do we use, you know, which of those methods. 
but there's a lot of interdisciplinary work um, that we're doing. And the National Environmental Health Association uh, is another big organization uh, that we're, we're just beginning to play with. Um, so we're up to the end of the uh, top of the hour. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for joining. Um, we will be posting this um, on our website once the recording is available and making it a